after you have completed your deliberations. Please understand that the court deputy will take the notes from you and the court deputy is going to give them to me and I'm going to destroy them. No one, including me, will ever review your notes. If you do take notes, please do not get so involved in your note taking that you become distracted from these proceedings. Your notes should be used only as an aid to your memory. Whether you take notes or not, you should rely on your own memory of the evidence and you should not be unduly influenced by the notes of any other juror. Notes are not entitled to any greater weight than each juror's memory of the evidence. During the trial, you may have a question about these proceedings. If so, please write it down and hand it to the court deputy who will then hand it to me. I will review your questions with the parties and the attorneys uh, before responding. Please put your juror number on the question, but do not put your name. And the juror number is the one that the clerk gave you and that we've been using over the last few days. During the witness testimony, you may have a question that you think should be asked of a witness. If so, there is a procedure for you to request that I ask the witness a question. After all the attorneys have completed their questioning of the witnesses, if you think you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. I will give you time to write that question on a sheet of paper. Please fold it and hand it to the court deputy who will bring it to me. Do not put your name or your juror number on the question that you have for the witness. I will go over those questions with the attorneys. Under our law, only certain evidence may be considered by a jury in determining a verdict. The jury is bound by the same rules of evidence that control the attorney's questions. If I decide that a question may not be asked under our rules of evidence, I will tell you that. Otherwise, I will direct the witness to answer the question. The attorneys may then ask follow-up questions if they wish. And then if there are additional questions from the jurors, you can then ask those additional questions. And we will follow that procedure until all the questions are exhausted. Now, by providing you this procedure, I do not mean to suggest that you must or that you should submit written questions for witnesses to answer. In most instances, the lawyers will have asked all of the necessary questions. So members of the jury, uh, we went in about 30 minutes and that uh, completes my instructions. The next thing on our uh, agenda is to do 90 minutes of opening statements. Does anyone wish to take a, a break now or are we ready to proceed for opening statements? For those uh, on Zoom, I'm sorry I didn't have that mic open, but it's open now. I apologize. Okay, so we are all good to go for the next 90 minutes. Mr. Anderson, you have the floor, sir. July 7th, 2015 through January 13th, 2017, Johns Hopkins missed a diagnosis of complex regional pain syndrome on seven different occasions when Maya was in for their care. We will prove that they misdiagnosed Maya's symptoms from October 7th through the end of the year, wrongfully accusing Beata and Jack Kowalski of child abuse and alleging and attempting to show that Maya had a mental disorder. She was crazy. She was making it up. 
will prove that they realize their error pretty quickly. And instead of apologizing, saying we're sorry. Continue, Mr. Anderson. Upon realizing their error, for the next three and a half months, they took every step in the world to attempt to force the Kowalskis to agree with the wrongful diagnosis. Maya Kowalski was falsely imprisoned and battered. She was denied communication with her family. She was denied communication with the outside. She was told that her mother was crazy. She was told by social workers that one in particular, she would be her mother. She was put into a room and left for 42 hours with the commode just out of reach because the hospital wanted to prove that she could actually get up and walk. So they wanted her on video, this is a surveillance room, to get out of bed and then go over to the commode when nobody was watching. Instead, she defecated on herself. For 42 hours, she was kept in that room, denied access to anyone or anything under the false assertion that it was an EEG exam. Maya was repeatedly battered by nurses and social workers who were trying to prove that she did not have CRPS. Things were done such as coming in and patting her on her leg. They were hugging her against her will, took her down to the chapel, sat her on the lap of one named Kathy Beatty, who told her that she would be her mother. Her mother was, you know, crazy, and that she needed a mother, and that social worker would be there. Maya was kept from her family and friends. She was denied access to her priest. She had what they called religious artifacts, such as holy water, uh, her prayer book, her rosaries taken from her, on the belief that her mother was controlling her over religion. She was denied access to counsel, at least insofar as having the ability to actually meet with her attorney without people listening in at the door. All of her phone calls were monitored. Her iPad computer were taken away because she was told she might be, this is a 10 year old, cruising internet, uh, cruising internet sex sites. Maya was denied the comforts of her friends and her family throughout her stay there. On another occasion, again, to try to show that Maya did not have rather significant symptoms of CRPS, which you'll see are these small little red angry lesions that appear on different parts of the body, underneath the arm, along the arms, sometimes on the legs, sometimes on the back. And you'll see photos here in a moment. But in order to prove that she didn't have one, she was systematically stripped and photographed against her will and without any authorization from anyone, least of all her parents. They continued to accuse the Kowalskis, Jack and Beata, of being child abusers, even after the evidence, we believe you'll conclude, was overwhelming 
that she had CRPS. In fact, we will see whether at some point they even admit she had CRPS in this case. Yet they still, throughout this period of time, continue to accuse Beata of child abuse and Jack of child abuse, something called Munchausen by proxy, which means that you're intentionally trying to keep your child ill. It's usually a circumstance with a very small child where a mother will be like putting uh, something in a, an IV or things like that. And Maya, at this time, was 10 years old. There is no evidence whatsoever of much of my heart proxy. By January 13th, when Maya was finally left out of the hospital, unsurprisingly, this family was a wreck. Maya was not let out of the hospital even after her mother committed suicide on January 7th of 2017. Now the story with Beata Kowalski is a complex one, and I'll tell you about it in a moment, but we will prove that the continued allegations that she was crazy and that she was trying to harm her own children, both Kyle and Maya, and the systematic, the knowledge of the systematic abuse of her child in the hospital caused her, at the end, to lose completely and utterly her ability to control the maternal instinct, and that that outweighed the survival instinct. In the process, they caused Beata Kowalski, her wife, Denied Jack a loving wife, denied both Kyle and Maya a loving, caring, and amazing mother. They caused just terrific and permanent psychological injury, as one may expect. A permanent aggravation, and we'll explain the medicine behind that, of the CRPS. Now, the CRPS didn't start with Johns Hopkins. It started about three or four days before Johns Hopkins. But the evidence will show that something that could have been a controllable, manageable disease was aggravated to the point where throughout periods in her life she will be incapacitated. And through all of it, she and her brother and her father will have post-traumatic issues and problems that will, frankly, uh, well, we'll get that into that in a moment. We've asked in this case for you to consider not only compute, compensatory damages to try to make them whole for these terrible things that have happened to them, but also punitive damages to deter them, to punish them, and to deter this type of behavior in the future. So some of the evidence here will be directed towards that. So. That's the overview of what we're trying to do. Now, how are we going to do it? First, you understand that we have really four plaintiffs here. We have Maya Kowalski right here. We have Kyle Kowalski, and we have Jack Kowalski. And Jack's also the parent and guardian of both of them, right? So the claims go through him. And then he has independent actions himself. And he's also appearing for the estate of his deceased wife, Bia. And each of them have causes of action, some of them combined. Now, this historic case has been going on. Uh, it was filed in October 2018. I tell you this because the facts, key facts in the case, began several years before. But through the course of time, we've taken an immense number of depositions. We have found audio tapes, videotapes, surveillance tapes, a lot of evidence for you to review towards proving these allegations. The core claims, again, are medical malpractice, which is that the defendants failed to meet the standard of care, and we will prove that through expert witnesses, that they failed to identify CRPS, which is also known, by the way, as RSD, the older name, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, 
now known as CRPS. Okay. They failed to identify it at first, and then they misdiagnosed it. And then once misdiagnosing it and realizing they misdiagnosed it, the evidence will prove they went about a system to try to get the Kowalskis to admit they were right. Battery, I've talked about. False imprisonment of Maya on multiple occasions. Intentional infliction of emotional distress is where you do things so outrageous that they cause damage and injury to a person. In this case, a suicide. In this case, traumatic disorders, depression, a multitude of emotional problems and issues. We've alleged fraud in that they intentionally deceived or attempted to deceive in the proof of the matter. We also alleged fraud in that they billed $536,000 for the treatment of CRPS and yet never treated her for CRPS and took multiple positions, especially to them, especially to Maya, that she did not have CRPS. Yet they billed over half a million dollars to the health care provider and to Kowalski's for the treatment of it. Beata Kowalski was born in 1973 in communist Poland. Uh, you may recall that the Berlin Wall came down in 1988 and in 1990 Within a couple of years, she was able to escape Poland at the age of 17 and come to the United States. She also all, uh, had a couple of relatives here already. So she made it over, stayed with relatives in Chicago, and got her AA in nursing, and then her BS in nursing, and then added to it two or three other specializations. Uh, and then uh, eventually, and we'll go to this in a moment, ended up an infusion nurse. Jack Kowalski was born in 1961. At the time all this went down, so Maya, let's see, Beata would have been 44 and would have been 50 today. Jack is 62 at this point. Jack was born and raised in Chicago. He was a firefighter and paramedic for over 28 years. Uh, rose to deputy chief uh, one of the Chicago fire departments. He uh, donated time during the post 9-11 recovery to help. He also did, uh, worked during Hurricane Katrina during the recovery effort. And we'll have some video, I think, about several saves Jack made, one in uh, rather dramatic of a wall collapsing right after he got some people out of the building. Um, for 9-11, he designed a license plate for 9-11 firefighters, the loss, uh, that's, I think, still in use. And he insists on distilling what he further insists on calling wine, which you will not have to try through the course of this case. That was a joke. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, it's just not. So Jack and Beata met in Chicago, and they were married on a uh, cruise in Jamaica in 2004 with friends. Um, Beata became stepmother to Jack's daughter Corrine by a prior marriage. Um, they were married, like I say, in 2004. They got along tremendously. There was uh, a lot of mutual interest, one of them scuba diving. Uh, Jack was, a, as we say, a firefighter. Beata was a well-trained nurse wor working for Loyola University Medical Center in the ca uh, cardiac catheter lab. Maya was born in 2005. Uh, Beata became, began working for CVS Corum as an in-home infusion nurse, which gave her a little more flexibility in terms of raising a family. And then Kyle was born in 2007. Interesting story there. Uh, Kyle was born with thrombocytopedia, which is low blood platelets. And because uh, they needed blood, Beata's blood specifically, but because she had just had a child, she could not give the blood. Beata got up, checked herself out, went to a uh, hospital down the street, gave the blood, collected the blood, came back to the hospital, <laughs> checked herself back in, and gave the uh, low platelet uh, combating blood 
to her, her baby son. Um, the couple moved to Florida in 2014. They already had uh, some family down here. One of Jack's brothers lived here, lives, uh, lived near them. And uh, Jack was able to retire after, I think, 25 years in the fire department. And Beato was able to transfer positions down to CVS Corum. And uh, she developed and had wonderful patients throughout the area here. Uh, Jack started applying to um, become a FEMA uh, representative using his experience as a firefighter. That plan as we'll see, was interrupted by what happened here. Uh, Maya, growing up, a typical healthy kid, uh, she had some asthma and allergies, as a lot of children do, uh, but nothing that wasn't controlled with the usual. She enjoyed ballet, gymnastics, uh, figure skating with her mom. It's a very big thing in Poland, figure skating. And so uh, Beata spent a lot of time with Maya towards that. And then Maya and Kyle enjoyed fishing in the backyard. Now, Kyle uh, has majored in being skinny for most of his life, although we're finally seeing him put on a little bit of weight, loves fishing. Um, and the new house in Florida they had over in Stonewalk, is that right? Uh, has a pond out back, which is very handy. Now on July 3rd, 2015, and this is a photo of the July 4th party, Maya started to feel a little bad. She apparently twisted her ankle in a gymnastics accident, and or just from doing gy gymnastics, I guess. And then on the 4th, during all the festivities, Maya simply collapsed on the floor of the kitchen, and I think you'll hear uh, Uncle Bob, her uncle, say she made a noise that no human child should make. And almost immediately had extraordinary pain, which developed over the course of the next three or four days to the point where it was extremely difficult for her to even walk. This was completely mysterious to everyone. She also had extremely rough coughing fits, which we'll have some, I think, I know we'll have audio of, may have some video of too, so you can see where these came from. These were not, <laughs> these were from deep within. Um, she was taken to the ER, and then the initial diagnosis was allergic reaction, reactive airway disease. There were multiple theories, but Maya was not getting better. And on July 6th, she, it was her first inpatient admission to Johns Hopkins. Now, uh, at this point, Maya could barely walk, and she was brought in, testing done. Of course, the parents and her brother are going nuts because they cannot figure out what's going on with her. And she is complaining of being in extreme pain. And so Beata, the nurse, gave a full history of everything she knew to that point, which really wasn't much because it had only been a few days. Johns Hopkins really didn't have much of a diagnosis at that point, although they thought maybe some of the steroids that Maya took from her asthma might have been you know, causing some reaction. So, her first consult with Suzanne Jackman from Johns Hopkins uh, notes low cortisol level, muscle pain, and muscle weakness. Says the pain and weakness may be steroid induced myopathy. And by this point, Maya, by July. 12th was discharged in a wheelchair. So she came into Johns Hopkins the first time, uh, walking with difficulty, left in a wheelchair. And the diagnoses at that point were secondary to steroid use, generalized muscle weakness, habit, cough. Steroid myopathy uh, is interesting in this case because I think one of the issues may be about the amount of ketamine it all uh, eventually took 
to control Maya's pain. And something I think you're going to find is that steroids that she takes for her asthma actually have a component that breaks down ketamine pretty readily. We'll, we'll get into that a little further and have some experts talking about it. And, and Maya, like every victim of CRPS, had good days and bad days, but her legs continued to wither. The second admission was July 17th through the 20th, an inpatient admission, again, to Johns Hopkins. There's a history and a physical uh, presents due to even more increased pain, now moving from her legs to her arms, her back, her stomach, her neck, and head. The differential diagnosis, myopathy, myositis, and now we start in with psychological pain conversion because they cannot figure out why this child has this degree of pain. In other words, no clue at this point. So as part of the uh, treatment, they, they suggest that Maya be taken somewhere else, TGH, Tampa General Hospital, for therapy. They thought maybe physical therapy would help the child. Uh, and as part of that transfer process, they sent Maya's history and physical notes to TGH, <laughs> and then had a phone call informing them that they thought this might be conversion disorder, this might be mental. So the first time any of these other doctors heard anything about Maya Kowalski, it was with an initial possible diagnosis that it was all in her head. The child couldn't walk, and certain symptoms were coming to the forefront by this point. Now, John, now, because Johns Hopkins couldn't figure out what the heck was happening, Maya was taken by Jack and Piata back up to Lurie's Children's Hospital in Chicago. Now, this is her former home. It was a familiar place. Uh, Lurie's had treated Maya for this asthma previously, and they thought, well, let's take him back and get a second opinion. And so, uh, and Johns Hopkins was aware that patients were going to seek a second opinion and contacted and talked to them about their theories. Um, the doctors in Chicago couldn't figure out what was going on either. So Jack and Beata proceeded with Johns Hopkins' recommendation to take him to Tampa General. Again, the doctors in Chicago thought, well, it could be steroid myopathy, it could be generalized muscle weakness, or maybe it's all in her head, but nobody made a diagnosis of that. She went to Tampa General Hospital, and TGH, as I said, already had Johns Hopkins records. Now keep this in mind, facts will show they already had the records, they already talked to them about what Johns Hopkins thought. All right, so Maya had inpatient comprehensive pediatric rehab and physical therapy and occupational therapy for the steroid myopathy. Now the reason this is important is that before, there are certain treatments that you get for CRPS before you start ramping up on some of the medicines that are used. So you want to see if the most basic types of therapies can bring somebody around to lower it to the point where it's, it, it's livable. CRPS never goes away. It is a permanent disease. It's merely controlled. But before you graduate on to more advanced treatments, you want to go through the basics. And fortunately, uh, they had the idea of trying PT and OT, but they did not spot that it was CRPS either. They still went with Johns Hopkins theory, excuse me, that it was steroid myopathy and that maybe there might be some psychological overlay. Again, they missed it. Uh, she was uh, evaluated for adrenal insufficiency, uh, inpatient treatment for mood and disorder. She's given Valium and Prozac. Again, this is a nine-year-old girl, ten-year-old girl. Hospital uh, alluded to Maya or Beata falsifying or exaggerating a fall from her bed uh, and missed several complaints, uh, missed, although they documented, several indications of CRPS. However, at that point, she was there for four weeks, and as it, the discharge diagnosis says, history of steroid-induced uh, myopathy, 
Noted as resolved by admission, gait disorder, impaired mobility, ADL, asthma, psychological factor affecting physical condition, conversion disorder versus factitious disorder versus others, anxiety disorder, myalgia. Now, importantly here, you'll see that it says resolved by admission. Well, we're going to bring in the actual physical therapist that treated her. And you will find throughout this case, the facts will show that there will be a distinct difference between what the actual people who were hands-on treating Maya had to say about how she was doing and whether she's progressing and what was put down in the medical records. The Tampa General Hospital visit was very difficult for her. At this point, she was displaying, uh, dis displaying what is known as dystonia. Dystonia is where the ligaments in your, it could be anywhere, but in this case, in her ankles and feet were contracting to the point where her feet were starting to turn in like this. This is a clear, clear indication of CRPS. Tampa General Hospital uh, thought that maybe they should put some boots on her and see if that would correct her feet turning in. And we'll have some video from the physical therapist that shows Maya attempting to walk in those boots, Maya attempting over and over again with things like trying to push her leg and saying, giddy up, horsey, again, remember, it's a nine-year-old girl, and demonstrating she was trying as hard as she could to walk. The evidence will show throughout this, Maya did not want to be in a wheelchair. She did not want to be one of the kids that was looking out the window while all the other kids were playing. But Maya kept getting worse, not better. And she was still in pain. And when school starts in 2017, uh, I'm sorry, 15, uh, she says she was still in pain throughout her body. And she would moan and scream in time in panic. And she kept getting weaker, weaker, and weaker. Now, Maya was in and out of Johns Hopkins throughout this period of time. Okay? And there was prescriptions for opioids, again, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Nothing was working. No one had any answers. And then a patient of Beata's, one of the infusion nurse patients, said, this may be CRPS. I have a, uh, a daughter with it, I believe. Why don't you look into seeing this? And there are doctors here in Tampa Bay area that, can, that are specialists in this. And, uh, and so... She went to see Dr. Anthony Kirkpatrick at the RSD Foundation, Reflex Sympathetic Dystrophy Foundation. Now, to diagnose the Budapest, to diagnose complex regional pain syndrome, the Budapest criteria for CRPS gives us certain specific symptoms, diagnostic criteria, persistent burning in the arms, hands, legs, feet, or another part of the body, check. Multiple, multiple medical records will show she had that. Pain can be mild or severe. We have actual audio recordings of Maya moaning. You'll see and hear the child and can determine whether or not she was in pain. Swelling, sweating, all of those. Dramatic changes in skin color and uh, skin temperature. Testimony is that Maya was constantly too hot or too cold. Now, people get too hot and too cold all the time, but usually they're not 9 or 10 year old children to the point where they're either shivering and need a blanket and then two hours later uh, are, are wondering why is it so hot in here. That kind of temperature change. And of course then blurred vision, which is already appearing in the records, dystonia, Again, the movement disorder, disorder like this, and then a really confusing <coughs> symptom called aldenia, which is an extreme but often inexplicable sensitivity to touch. It means that on some occasions, you could come up and squeeze Maya's arm or touch her legs and get no reaction at all. And at other times, just the thought of someone coming up to her and putting their hand near her as though they were going to touch her would give off an incredible reaction, screaming, yelling resistance to anyone even touching her. Reason? That because of the RSD, CRPS, 
she would feel extraordinary pain as a result. But it doesn't happen all the time, and it doesn't mean that when you don't have it, you're not in pain. One of the experts will testify that this is sort of like, think about it as a cancer patient or someone with an intermittent disease. You may be in remission and be doing fine and look fine to everybody outside. You may be hurting like crazy on the inside, but outside you look pretty good. And then other times you may be curled up in a fetal position and not be able to walk, talk, or move. Also a light sensitivity. Interestingly, the Budapest criteria, which are kind of the accepted criteria for CRPS, are also listed by Johns Hopkins as their diagnostic, diagnostic criteria for CRPS, right? So she goes and sees uh, Anthony Kirkpatrick, Dr. Kirkpatrick, who you'll uh, meet. Now, uh, notice on the photograph, see the feet there turned in? Notice the lack of muscle mass on the legs. Um, she's in a wheelchair, obviously, and that's sort of a attempted smile, but she's got sunglasses on. Now, why is a child wearing sunglasses inside at the doctor's office? Because she has a sensitivity to light caused by the CRPS. So Dr. Kirkpatrick went over the entire full history list of symptoms and therapies tried. He did objective testing, including pain uh, threshold test, range of motion test. We'll actually have the videos from before and after where you can see that before the treatments she eventually had and are part of the uh, issues in this case, she can barely get her hand, uh, arm up to here, and then you'll see after the therapies that they ultimately complained about that she can put her arm hand completely over the other side. And the diagnosis was CRPS. Now, Dr. Kirkpatrick did not say, all right, let's just go into some heavy uh, duty pain meds or anything else. Again, he said, let's try some physical therapy and what's known as warm water therapy, which is essentially where you use a very warm pool or bath or something and you do it in there to loosen up the muscles. A little different, but again, physical therapy. He did not recommend out of the box any sort of pain meds. That didn't work and that's when he introduced them to a revolutionary use of an old drug called ketamine and the ability to uh, break the chain. See, CRPS involves a problem in the pathways between the pain sensors in different parts of the body and the brain. Usually when someone injures themselves, you sprain a finger or something, out, it hurts like heck. But over time, right, it starts hurting less and less and less. And pretty soon after a while, you just kind of forget about it. That doesn't happen with CRPS. Because of a problem as yet not understood, which is why we don't have any cure, the pain relay, the, the circle, the loop here of feedback is getting bigger and bigger and bigger until what was once a tiny little fracture or a tiny little sprain or whatever you want to call it turns into something that is the worst pain known to medical science. I'll talk about that in a moment. And ketamine, which has been around since the 1950s, it's FDA approved, it's used mostly as an anesthetic, but, and, it, and it's not an opioid. It doesn't work like an opioid. But for some reason, I fully understood, it breaks this, this uh, feedback loop and people start getting better. Not all of them, but a very high percentage get better. So there's a, actually, I think, do we have the audio on this? Uh, so this is one of the initial visits with Dr. Kirkpatrick discussing uh, the, the use of the ketamine infusions. And I want you to concentrate on what this, uh, this mom, who's also a nurse, is asking about. in your <coughs> administers the ketamine? I do. You do, okay. Yeah. And I'm ACLS certified also. I have to take to Yeah, you have to be. Well, pals. you got to have mm -hmm. your pals. Yeah, and, all that CLS, stuff. Yeah. Um, and we have a pediatric code card back there. You know, we have to do all that stuff if we're going to do the Good. Children. Absolutely. Yeah. That was my next they're, question. They're do you have a pediatric yeah. crush card? No, we have to. We have to. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's a standard of care. You mm -hmm. have to do 
Now, Beata knew all about how to keep her daughter healthy, not this disease, but how to keep her daughter healthy and how to protect her daughter. And notice in there, one the first thing she asked about, is there an ACLS crash cart? Are there all the different equipments that you might need, even during an infusion, because remember, she's an infusion nurse, in case anything could go wrong. Now, here's the McDill, McGill, excuse me, pain scale. This is interesting. I, I had no idea until, uh, until I reviewed this. But, I'm oh, sorry, uh, this right here, as you can see, this goes over, and this was developed in Australia. It's been around for a long, long time. It's adopted by about every hospital, every medical uh, association. And this describes the different pain levels according to description by patients and every other objective finding that, that one can make. And you'll see at the top that CRPS is the most painful. It was actually developed at the University of Montreal, Canada by Dr. Waslasko, I guess, and most of the clinical trials were, I believe, in Australia. Symptoms of CRPS, we have gone over those. It strikes mostly females in the population between the ages of 7 and 21. It is known for initial sy symptoms that are inexplicable. However, upon close review and a differential diagnosis to rule out other things and consider neurological disorders, this is one of them. And if you can identify a few of these symptoms, our experts will say CRPS should have been brought into the mix very quickly. That did not happen here. All right, so from October 6th through 8th, she has her first ketamine infusion with Dr. Kirkpatrick, a follow-up. And the first infusion went well and helped to get Maya out of pain, and there was a lot of encouragement over that. He wasn't pushing for more ketamine. He's simply trying to instruct on a conservative approach, warm water therapy. Let's try the ketamine again. They tried it again and again. Got some good relief, but not for very long. Maybe for a week, 10 days. But not what they were looking for, to bring this child back to being a normal kid, right? So um, at this point, Dr. Kirkpatrick says, well, she might need more and frequent uh, of these infusions, so why don't you go over to Johns Hopkins and visit for a PICC line placement? And so on uh, November 4th, she goes back to Johns Hopkins for a PICC line placement, and the diagnosis over there accepted is CRPS. And so Johns Hopkins itself does the PICC line. PICC line is a, a, it's basically a tube that's put in so you can do the infusions a lot easier without trying to find uh, a vein. All right, so, and she begins uh, therapy because, again, everybody wants to find out, is this really anything exaggerated by Maya? Is there a psychological component to this? Uh, let's just make sure. So Maya starts with a therapist by the name of Rebecca Johnson, uh, and I believe you'll hear from Ms. Johnson or uh, uh, Michelle Rogers, who is her partner there, about those. Maya was never determined to have any type of conversion disorder or factitious disorder by any psychiatrist or psychologist, except that as part of CRPS, there can be certain symptoms of conversion, which is, how do you explain this? The feelings of pain become so exaggerated, this allodynia, that the patient is anticipating pain before it actually happens. So she goes and has the therapy, but still nothing is working and nothing is really getting her out of the extreme pain on a long-term uh, basis. So Dr. Kirkpatrick, and you'll hear from Dr. Kirkpatrick here to explain all of this. Unfortunately, in the United States, the procedure that would have been shown to work the best for intractable CRPS long-term ketamine infusion under general <coughs> anesthesia, a medical coma for four, three, four, five days is not performed in the United States. It's performed in Germany, it's performed in Mexico. It had been around since approximately the 1990s. 
it had essentially a 100% rate of safety, that is, no one had ever died from it, and it had a very high rate of success. There is a, a physician, a University of Texas trained uh, uh, anesthesiologist, Dr. Fernando Cantu, who is going to fly here from Mexico uh, to describe the process. And it involves, again, uh, infusions of ketamine over a very long period of time, the idea being that it causes the brain to reset so that you don't have this feedback loop causing the pain. The first one uh, in late November, 19th through the 23rd, there is a uh, high dose infusion and what do you know, the lesions begin to heal and there's a slight less turning out of the feet. And yet the pain was still not where they wanted it. So Maya stayed there and then on November 19th through the 23rd, she went through another high dose ketamine infusion. Now, during this period of time, other, other than during the middle of the infusion process, there were absolutely no negative signs from Maya. She had a brief increase in her liver function results, but only we're talking for a matter of hours. And as soon as the ketamine infusion was done, they went right back. And it's important to note that other than at that time and through all of her ketamine treatments, Maya's liver functions, which is the things you look at if you've got a medication like this and you want to see is it hurting somebody? You look at the liver functions, and her liver functions have stayed normal throughout. And you'll see the medical records to show that. All right. So then, a miracle. By December 28th, Maya's lesions are noticeably less. Her feet are starting to not be as turned out. In fact, by the end of January, and we'll show you the films, She's actually able to get back in the pool. You can see a picture of her here in, I believe, late uh, January. And this is her. You'll notice the feet looking better. She's on Kyle's shoulders there. You'll notice a real smile coming up. She's able to do her warm water therapy. But she still is having some pain. And the idea here was to get this kid out of the wheelchair, right? They wanted to get her out of the wheelchair. And to get her out of the wheelchair, they really needed to get the feet totally back and they needed to get the pain levels back so it wasn't so painful when she walked so she could build up her legs. That was the idea. So they go back to Johns Hopkins, okay? All right. Central port it means there's an operation and there's the note. Placement implanted central venous port. That's a tube under her arm to allow her to continue high-level fusion. Not like Mexico, but uh, outpatient procedures. And she has a number of them through the course of the next nine months. Through the course of this, and with a doctor named Dr. Hannah, who Dr. Kirkpatrick recommended, Dr. Cantu recommended, because frankly, ketamine is incredibly expensive and it's not covered by health insurance. So uh, Dr. Hanna was set up to do these on a regular basis. Oh, yeah. oh, I better get going. Okay, so Maya goes back to Johns Hopkins, and Dr. Anthony Kreisman, who had seen her before, the long-term ketamine infusion, quote, ketamine coma, and they commented on how withdrawn and how much pain she's in, Listen to what he says on May 11th after about 30 of these infusions and the long-term infusion. She is a completely different child from when last examined. By that I mean she is not in any pain, she is not moaning, she is smiling and interactive, she is very engaged. She moves spontaneously in her wheelchair without incurring pain. Through the course of that summer, because the ketamine is so expensive, they tried two other therapies. One's known as hyperbaric. You can see it right here. Extreme high oxygen content, which has been known to help some CRPS patients. She also tries the uh, IVIG treatment to increase her immune system because it's believed that CRPS can be, uh, uh, the immune system may be part of CRPS. And by the end of the summer, she is almost back on her feet. This is in 2016, around August of 2016. 
Maya is almost back on her feet. We have video of her actually uh, using that as kind of a, a jungle gym to try to strengthen up her arms and her legs. Everyone is very excited. Everybody is looking forward to Maya getting on her feet. And then she has what they hope to be a minor relapse that turns into a fairly major relapse. And uh, on top, she goes back and has larger ketamine doses with Dr. Hannah on October 5 and 6. And she has some gastrointestinal problems and a lot of pain in the midsection. There are stories that you will hear about her screaming at night. She could not take the pain in her stomach anymore. At one point, the, pain, the screaming was so intense that the family got walkie-talkie so the family could stay all the way over on this side of the house and Maya over here because no one could sleep. So they communicated by walkie-talkie. All right, so they decided on the 7th, October 7th, a key date, to take her to Johns Hopkins ER. Now the reason was that we had Hurricane Matthew tracking up. If you, uh, you know, if you've been in Florida long enough, the hurricanes start to blur together. I believe it's Hurricane Matthew is tracking up the eastern seaboard here, getting winds like I don't know, 35 to 50 miles an hour. Um, you know, to people from Florida, it's like wake us up when it's a Cat Four, and um, but to you know the Kowalskis were from Chicago and uh, had never experienced this before. They had visions of like a movie Twister going around in their head. And so they, all of the ERs and everything were closed. So they took her up to St. Pete to the ER. And Maya is seen by five different doctors and groups of nurses and social workers from the ER. And she comes in about 8.46 in the morning and she's crying and screaming. And she's in a fetal position clutching her stomach and she is just out of her mind. And the ER doctors there start to react rather negatively to this. Beata comes in approximately two to three hours later and once again goes through the history, which Jack has been trying to relay, of all of the different visits to Johns Hopkins and all the different treatments and how everything has failed. And the only thing that has worked has been the long-term ketamine infusions. And we can try this. Can we try that? Can we try a, a pump? Can we try, what can we do to get our daughter out of pain? For some reason, the doctors there either review all the past records and the some seven to eight to nine prior visits and the fact that she's had surgery there to have a port implanted to help her with the ketamine infusion. But for some reason, they decide that that isn't it at all. She really doesn't have CRPS. That the mom must be making all of this up. That this is, as a nurse, who we think is the one who actually made this diagnosis, Munchausen by proxy. Textbook Munchausen by proxy. Now imagine this is an ER, the child's back there, the parents pulling their hair out, trying to explain to the hospital, this is what Jack will testify to, and Beata is trying to explain to them in an ER where they've been about five times before exactly all the history that's going back that's already in their records, including records from the other hospital. Everything's there. For some reason, the doctors, nurses, and social workers ignore all of that and decide this is not CRPS, that this is the child is making it up and the parents are making it up and then this must be child abuse by the parents. Now the court has told you that there's pretty much a hair trigger on suspicions, and so they make the call, and that's not part of this case. You can make, you're supposed to make the call. Slightest, slightest different uh, suspicion, you're supposed to make the call. So that's not a bad thing, whether it was right or not, at that moment. The case is about what happens after that, and the failure to diagnose previously so that none has ever happened. Maya, they try to take Maya home after the first night. They're told that they need to observe the child overnight. Fine. 
But by the second day, Maya is still in pain. They do knock her out with a lot of drugs uh, to get rid of the initial pain. And they give her ketamine. So the next day, she's much calmer. And so then they decide that Maya cannot go home. They decide that taking her home is AMA, against medical advice. And they say, if you try to take your daughter home, we're calling security. So the Kowalskis don't have much choice. They end up leaving. And the next thing they know, they're off to the races. On, and Maya is an unbelievable journey up through and including the death of Beata. Now, what you'll notice in the records again, the records paint a glowing report of mine. Just how great she's doing, how much she enjoys things. What a great stay she's having. She's getting this, she's getting that. The only thing she was getting to do was play the piano. Maya knows how to play the piano. She got to play the piano, and she got to draw pictures. And every once in a while, she could send a letter. If she wanted to talk to her mom, it had to be on a supervised call. She could only see her dad and her brother on pre-arranged and monitored situations. If she wanted to see, they hired an attorney, obviously. If she wanted to see her attorney, the nurses would demand that the door stay open. She never had a private moment with an attorney. They're Polish Roman Catholic, which is about as Roman Catholic as you can get, and they have a very close relationship with their priest. So the priest went in to see Maya, and he will testify that when he arrived, he was told that he could not see Maya, and that she had had her religious artifacts taken away. We have a photograph of it. And he asked about this, and they said it's because we believe her mom is controlling her through religion. And so he was not allowed to see her that day, and it took a few other attempts, and then finally he was allowed in, but he was told no religious procedures. You come say hello, no religious procedures. I told you already about the 42 hours of being placed in a darkened room and told this is a new type of EEG, Maya. We're going we're gonna to really figure this out if this is in your mind or not. No, it wasn't. It was the surveillance room. And again, the goal, because these doctors had somehow gotten confused to think that CRPS includes paralysis. Paralysis is not part of CRPS at all. And yet, they were trying to prove that Maya could actually get out of bed, that she was faking it, that she was sitting in that wheelchair all the time, just, I don't know what reason, but she was faking all this. It actually, when nobody was watching, Maya was getting up out of that chair and walking around everywhere. So they put the commode just a little bit out of reach, right? Figuring, when she thinks nobody's watching, she'd get up, you know, she'd go to the bathroom, go over there. Well, that didn't happen. And you'll see video of Maya having to be carried over to the commode. Of course, her skin started to show the lesions again. Maya started on a dive. Badly, badly getting worse. Depressed. The lesions are forming. You'll see them. Uh, yeah, here... Uh, now, they just may look like scratches here, but you can't see too much of the stuff on the back. What you'll notice through the series of photographs, and thank goodness, Dad here took photographs of Maya's lesions. And you'll see those photographs, and I want you to compare them to the medical records, because you'll see on the dermatog dermatological reports, you'll see skin normal. And yet you'll have photographs from that day showing lesions. On January 6th, they decided that they needed photographs to prove that Maya really didn't have as many lesions as they said. So they brought someone else in 
And we have better pictures. You can see a little bit of Maya's face there. They claim, oh, this didn't bother her at all. There was no authorization from the family, no notification to the family. Maya was screaming bloody murder not to do this because it hurt. They took off her clothes except for her training bra and her shorts, pulled down her shorts, pulled up her shorts there to take photographs of her. Now they're testimony is, oh, this wasn't bad on her at all. She was fine with it. No. What she told is, if you don't let us take photographs, you're not going to see your mom. That's what they told her. So, they end up taking photographs, and somehow, where are the photographs? We've only got a few. We do have photographs from the father at the time, however. So, by this point, it's pretty bad. Let's talk just briefly about Beata. During this period of time, Beata is only allowed to talk to her daughter. Hopefully we'll be able to play some of the tapes where we'll be able to hear Beata trying to talk to her daughter. But they put th certain things off limits, like, how are you doing? How is your treatment? How is your medication? Things like that. No, you can't talk about that. Not allowed to talk about that. They're the most mundane things in the, you can imagine on these telephone calls. We are allowed to use them. And... In those, you'll hear one of the social workers, Kathy Beatty, who was assigned Maya. Now, she was a social worker from one floor, but wherever Maya went, Kathy Beatty followed. And we have the trail of emails and notes leading from notification to the general counsel, through risk management, on down to one of the senior doctors, down to Beatty, about doing this stuff, including what you just saw there in the photograph. We'll prove they knew it at the highest levels. Beata is going freaking nuts, the evidence will show. They find out that Beatty's had some disciplinary problems. They find out, kind of through the grapevine, how bad things are for Maya. They find out about the lesions. Now her feet are completely turned in. And Maya has become so weak, the CRPS has developed to the point where she can't sit up straight, okay? Now, uh, on the evening of January 7th, Beata, they were going to a party, Jack and Kyle were going to a birthday party, I think. And Beata had been, uh, not ask, acting herself at all for a number of days. And she didn't want to go to the birthday party. She didn't really want to go anywhere for a long time. <coughs> the only thing she did was go to work. She was withdrawing. She and Jack had been having screaming fights because Jack did not want her to be so absorbed in this. He was more of the, let's just try to get her out of there, work her out. And Beata was trying everything, legal, social, every possible way to get her child out, and her child was not coming out, and she found out through several sources the condition that Maya was in and what was happening to Maya. And on that evening, once they were out, she decided to take uh, some belts and put them together, go out to the garage, make a noose, put a stand below her feet to be able to reach it, she took an IV of saline solution and put the IV in her arm and left a cell phone with a note that said, retribution, retaliation, retaliation out. And she left two suicide notes, which we'll try to bring before you, telling you about why she did it. It took probably about 22 minutes, according to pathologists, to strangle to death. She would kicked the stand out from under her. When Jack and Kyle got home, they thought that she was in sleeping in another room, which they did a lot, you know, because they, they weren't getting along, frankly. And so nobody did that. And then uh, Beata's brother was coming in that night. He came in and just went to sleep, got up the next morning, walked out into the garage, I guess looking for something, and at first he thought it was a Halloween direction, uh, Halloween uh, 
I don't know, costume or something, and he looks closer and it's his sister. And he, of course, just completely screams out. And Jack comes in, sees his wife with Kyle right behind him. Kyle was, I don't know, we'll ask him how much he was able to see. Uh, 911 call made. You'll hear that. And uh, Beata is taken down. Uh, we'll have some, we're not going to get gross on them. We're not going to try to upset you too much on the photos, but we will show you some of the photos, right? Okay. Now, after that, Jack says, let my daughter go. If Beata is the big reason here, if she's the Munchausen by proxy, why keep Maya? No. No. It takes another week and a half, and Maya, let me get this straight. Maya's actually told in the hospital that her mom's dead. Johns Hopkins believes it's still in her head. And there's a text that goes around about how Maya's now better off because her mom's dead. Between two of the doctors, you'll hear testify. Finally, after a lot of effort, Maya gets to go home. Now, I'm not sure if I got the photograph on this, but I'll show you a photograph. You can see on the ride home, she's, you'll see, she's got stuffed animals underneath her, and she's slumped over like this because she's so weak she can't keep herself up. Through the course, then, okay. All right. So <laughs> the hospital will now come in and tell you just how great their therapies were. We'll show you the records, and they were not doing any therapies with Maya. They were warehousing the child. Maya gets home. And with her parents' care, oh, and one other thing, the hospital doesn't want any more use of ketamine ever again. And we'll get into the details of that. So just using the old, regular, and largely ineffective pain meds, this child manages uh, through warm water therapy and being home with support and love about eight months to get out of the wheelchair. Now, our folks, I want you to compare that to the time after they first learned about how to use the ketamine and how fast it took to get her ready to roll, right? Out of pain. This child does it in extreme pain. So she's on crutches here about the spring of... August of 2017. Yeah, August of 2017. And it takes another year until Maya can walk unassisted. She's on crutches. One tough cookie, and we'll talk about just how tough she really is to be able to go through all this. Uh, things go well for another couple of years. But in 2020, she has another bit of bad news about her schooling and has yet another relapse. This time, again, similar to the one in 2016, and similar if it was an emotional issue, the one right before she went into Johns Hopkins, all the bad stuff happened. Pretty much the same type of symptoms, and she ends up back in the hospital, and she has to be put on a feeding tube because she's in so much pain she can't feed herself. So fortunately, after about a week and a half there, a week there, she was able uh, to get well enough to come out and uh, proceed on her way, and again, had to start over in some ways, and was uh, able to rejoin a lot of her life. Without her mother, uh, Jack lost a wife, Kyle lost a mother, and the effects on the family are, well, you'll just have to listen to, to hear so, we're asking for damages for the physical injury, the overwhelming pain, not simply from the ketamine alone, but from the aggravation of the ketamine. Let me talk about this. Now, the, the, the CRPS started before 
Johns Hopkins ever got a fish. Okay? But, but, the evidence from every doctor that's a specialist in it will tell you that it is vitally important during the first episode of CRPS that you properly manage it <coughs> in order to prevent an aggravation of the disease to the point where it's going to reappear and you will have longer, more frequent, and more devastating episodes down the road. The ketamine's nickname is the suicide disease. So the law is then that if you take a symptom, an illness or an injury, and you aggravate it to the point where that person has a lot more pain, a lot more trouble with it, that unless some doctor can come in and identify the percentages back and forth, they're on the hook for the whole thing. All the ramifications. So now we've got long-term effects, and we're going to give you mortality tables so you'll be able to know how many years out. I'll give you some formulas on, on how to try to do this. I, I'm just an advisor. You ultimately will make all the decisions here. right? But. I'll try to help with some formulas of how you can calculate such things. It's a difficult job. We talked about this in Guadir, right? All right. So we'll talk about each and every one of these. We'll talk about the physical injuries. We'll talk about, and Jack has, we, I haven't spent any time on Jack, but we'll get into that again on the testimony. Suffice to say, it's been devastating to not have his wife and the mother of his children. Kyle's lost a mom and the effects on him. So we'll talk about the pain and suffering, the mental anguish that you will carry around, they will carry around from not having a mother and knowing your mother killed herself for you. We'll have inconvenience. Now, you know, Viana was a nurse, so she could take care of herself and she could take care of her family. She's not around. Loss of capacity to enjoy life. There's this thing called alhedonia, which means that you lose the ability to have pleasure out of things that once gave you pleasure. Maya tried figure skating. She won't do that anymore. Uh, Maya's not going back to gymnastics. Maya doesn't want to play piano anymore. The family doesn't want to go back to the church. And the family is having an extremely difficult time staying in the house. There's diminished earning capacity because what happens on your job if every you know year or two or every six months you have this debilitating episode where you can't work and you can't explain how long it's going to be and whether you're going to be able to do anything at home or not. Uh, and like I talked about, the aggravation of the pre-existing symptoms and the illness. So then we ask you to consider punitive damages. Our argument is this, that <clears throat> these actions are so completely and utterly it's designed to deter not only here, but in the future. And it's designed to punish, right? And so your decision there would be predicated on how much money does it take if we got to that point. What alters behavior of companies like that? So, that's your job. Is to figure a little bit of, out about this, a lot about this. And so, I I was trying to figure out where the defense is going on this. Uh, I think it is that from their doctor's point of view, those doctors in the ER and uh, hospitalist view, uh, Beata was crazy, and they thought she was going to try to hurt her daughter. They haven't explained why. Maya did not come in with a bruise, a bump, a cut, a scrape, any bad uh, medical tests, no bad blood work, and yet they deduced from their discussions with her 
over the course of a few hours that it was actually her plane. Uh, we will show you that up until this point, periodically through the latter probably 10 years of her life, Fiata had had periods of anxiety and she got treated with things like Xanax for that. And she had two periods of depression where she had some anti-depression uh, stuff, never long-term and all situational to events in her life. After January of 2016 and her daughter had been through this, she sought counseling and maintained counseling to try to get through what she was going through. We'll have Dr. Tashana Duncan come in. Circumstances about her, she's a PhD psychologist who uh, knew the story and did an intensive amount of research and she says there was nothing wrong with Biata whatsoever. And not a single psychiatrist or psychologist is gonna come in and tell you any different here. And we doubt you're going to hear anything from a psychologist or psychiatrist to say that Beata, that Maya was making any of this up or that she was suffering from factitious disorder or conversion disorder. We doubt, seriously, you'll hear that. And if the defense does come up with something, listen to my cross. They say that the amount of ketamine that the CRPS doctors were using, and the fact of the uh, ketamine, as they call it, the, the, the ketamine coma, it's, it's kind of, uh, in this case, that's their, that's their boogeyman, is the ketamine coma. You'll hear one of the doctors say that the, uh, that's the reason why they should be able to take Maya away from the parents, it's because they didn't think that that was, uh, that, that that was met the Johns Hopkins standard of care. So because it didn't meet their idea of how to treat CRPS, their argument is that that justifies taking the child away. So what else? Uh, I think they're gonna try to say that because their medical records said CRPS here and there early on and then down the road that they were justified for billing $536,000 for a disease that they vigorously deny she ever had and instead was always in her head. I think what they're gonna say there is that, well, because some of the treatments we use can be used for CRPS, see, we could bill that. We have a memo, an internal memo, that says that they actually made a conscious decision to up their billing rate to CRPS because it's so much higher. See, CRPS takes a lot of effort to treat. You need occupational therapy, you need warm water therapy, you need physical therapy, you need psychological therapy, you've got a lot of different things that go into it. And so it's very expensive. But if you're just, evidence will show, warehousing a child while billing for CRPS, well. And you'll hear from the actual experts about ketamine infusions, why it takes so many and what you do to determine dosage. It's called titration. Maya had pre-existing treatment by a drug that broke down the ketamine. So for what us would feel like, you know, a Jimmy Buffett concert level of beers, to Maya we feel like two beers. And so that's kind of the relevance of, not a very good one, but the relevance of the ability of the the steroids to break down the ketamine internally. Plus, you gotta give more to kids than you do to adults. Plus, she was on this uh, medication for about uh, 14 months, and so there's tolerances. So the way the anesthesiologists do it, which is the way all anesthetic is done, is that you titrate up. You sp start on smaller doses virtually every time, and you increase until the patient has a therapeutic effect. You know, it's take, taking them out of, of pain. It's having the right effect on them. There is no evidence anywhere that Maya Kowalski was ever in any danger. Maya Kowalski ever suffered any negative effect whatsoever. It is, the evidence will show it is all speculation on what could possibly happen. And I believe the defense will present themselves as the saviors of this family. 
15. Thank you. I may not even actually use it all. So we'll lay it out. We'll bring in witnesses to tell you about CRPS. We'll tell you witnesses who spoke with Maya, uh, excuse me, Beata on her descent to the point where she felt the only way to get her child out of there, the maternal instinct was to kill herself. Take herself out of the picture, daughter released. We'll present the experts on psychiatry, on ketamine, on the uh, use of it. On, we'll have the doctor flying up, the ketamine commas from Mexico. We will have psychiatrists who have studied this. We'll have the actual therapist at the time. You may actually hear from some of the doctors from the outpatient part of Johns Hopkins and some of the people that were there at the time who have agreed to testify. So we'll do our very best and we'll try to introduce video and audio and photographic evidence to document every single element of our case. So, Nick sort of serves as my walking um, laptop computer reminding me of stuff when I forget it. There's much to tell you. When you've been pretty patient here listening to all of this, it's an emotional thing. What we will do is try to bring you together. What you do with it is up to you. I will put on the best evidence we can. I'll have the chance to talk to you at the end. Okay? Well, thank you. Hey, members of the jury, in a moment I'm going to uh, excuse you so you can have your uh, morning recess. I want to remind you, you may not discuss this case amongst yourselves, you may not do any investigation and receive no information. Let's try to keep this to a 15-minute break. If you could follow uh, Deputy Coley out the door, I would appreciate it. Just leave your notes in the Redwell. Thank you very much. All right, Hey everyone, please be seated. The jury is out of our presence. Are there any issues we need to address before we take our break? Not by plan, Sean. We'll do it Thank you very much. I'm going to switch the feed to the defense side for the uh, projectors, so uh, you can practice that over the break. And other than that, let's try to keep this to a 15-minute break, everyone. All right, of course, recess.
Please be seated, everybody. Okay, I want to want to remind everybody here that's in the audience that uh, you cannot take pictures. The there is a pool photographer that the media has designated. If there's any questions from the members of the media, talk to our public information officer, Donna Rhodes, uh, who has been in and out uh, through the proceedings. But we do have pool camera arrangements uh, for the media, for the members of the general public. Uh, under our rules, you're not allowed to take photos while you're here in the courtroom. Any issues we need to address? Not like no, Okay. We ready to bring the jury in? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, let's bring the jury in. I don't know what you're trying to say, Mr. Hunter. Yes. Okay, everyone, please be seated. Okay, members of our jury, I want to confirm while you were away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves, you did no investigation, and you received no information. Is that all correct? Yeah, correct. Is that? Defense, it's your turn. Good uh, morning, almost afternoon. My name is Howard Hunter, and I have the privilege of representing Johns Hopkins Hall Children's Hospital and the people who staff it and who make it. Uh, we're here today to defend this case, and we appreciate the time and energy that you have put into this effort thus far. You're the most important people here, and we appreciate your attention. We appreciate your commitment both to the trial process and to the process of waiting until you've heard all the evidence before you make a decision or begin to formulate a decision. Uh, with me today, first of all, let me in introduce my team. With me today are my co-counsels, Pat Crowells, Ethan Shapiro, David Hughes. We also have today a representative from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, Dr. Dr. Anthony Napolitano. See it over over there. Dr. Napolitano may or may not wind up seeing you as a witness as well. You'll see doctors rotating as corporate representatives during the trial. Uh, they've asked to do that for the purpose of being part of the effort to defend the hospital in this matter. Uh, the hospital, after all, is not just a big pile of bricks and mortar. It's the doctors and nurses and people and professionals who run it. And so we're here representing them, although I'll be referring to the institution generally, for brevity's sake, as either ACH or, jo or All Children's Hospital. I mean, you may hear Johns Hopkins occasionally, but I've been Representing them for a long time, long before they were John Hopkins. Uh, this is a case that has a number of different facets to it. And the circumstances and facts that I'm about to discuss with you constitute our view of the evidence. You've just heard Mr. Anderson tell you their view. 
I'm about to tell you ours. Judges told you, and it's absolutely correct, that what you hear from me is not evidence. It's my view of what the evidence will show. This case involves a number of different facts that occurred over about 18 to 24 months. I can't cover all the details in 90 minutes, and if I did, both you and I would have our heads swimming from the effort. So I'm going to go over some high points. I'm going to, to, to discuss some matters that Mr. Anderson touched upon, and I'm going to ask your indulgence as we fill in the blanks over the next several weeks. Um, this sequence of events began on October 7th, 2017. That's where the plaintiff's case against Johns Hopkins began. Before that, you're going to hear a good bit of evidence about what went before. You're going to hear about the development of, of Maya Kowalski's disease process. You're going to hear about where else she sought care. You're going to hear a lot about the details of that care and a lot about the problems with it. I'm going to cover some of those in just a moment. But the point is, for now, that as of October 7th of 2016, Kowalski's had been to Johns Hopkins several times. They had entrusted Maya Kowalski's care to us on several different occasions. And in doing so, they had come up from their home in Venice, past Sarasota Memorial, a number of other hospitals, and sought out care from all children. Presumably, we vindicated their trust in doing that, and they came back to see us on, August, on October 7th. We had no reason to wish this family harm and we still don't. Indeed, there's a tragic outcome in this case in terms of Mrs. Kowalski's suicide, and we regret very much that that happened. The issue here, however, is who's responsible for it. And we're going to go over the facts of that and what the facts don't show in terms of any connection between what was done by all children and that tragic result. Now, as of October 7th, we had the Kowalskis seeking out care at all children's, as I've said. We believe the evidence is going to show you that care was reasonable and necessary and appropriate. And indeed, we're going to suggest to you the evidence I'm about to discuss with you will show that what went before, the treatment that went before, did not necessarily fall into that category, any of those three categories. And that is the reason, one of the big reasons, that we're here today. Now, as of this date, as of the time that Maya Kowalski was discharged from all children's, we believe that, in fact, she had been set on a path of therapy that has enabled her to resume function, to get out of a wheelchair, to be relatively pain free, and to be in a situation of participating in her school and in society as she does today. So how did we get there? Well, on October 7th, Maya Kowalski was brought to the emergency room at All Children's. As you've heard, she had bad stomach pain. She was screaming, crying, thrashing around, cursing at staff, very upset, and presenting a very challenging situation for the staff. She had pain in all her extremities. She had her whole body being said to be hypersensitive to any kind of touch. She was unable to walk. She was had legs atrophied from disuse, from being in a wheelchair for months at that point, or maybe over a year. She had dystonia, alleged dystonia, different position of her feet, as you've heard, and she was demanding pain medication, pain medication in large quantities. 
Mrs. Kowalski arrived a, a while later, and you're going to hear that when she arrived, she forbade the doctors and the nurses to touch Molly. The doctors and the nurses wanted to assess her, to examine her, to put on a blood pressure cuff, to put on an O2 SAP monitor, to take a temperature, and they wanted to find out why there was all this horrible stomach pain. Was it appendicitis? Was it a, was it a torsion of, of, the, of the intestines? Was there something badly wrong that an ultrasound or, or a, a flat plate of the abdomen or a CT scan could detect? Those questions were being asked. Mrs. Kowalski insisted that before there be any workup of the child, she wanted ketamine. Now, not just any amount of ketamine. You're going to hear a lot about ketamine in this trial. Ketamine is indeed an old drug, and it's a drug that is approved by the FDA for use as an anesthetic. It is not approved for use in children, nor is it approved for use in high doses as treatment for CRPS or chronic pain. That's one of the issues here. It's not just ketamine itself but how it was used and the quantity in which it was used. Because ketamine is an anesthetic, it is an hallucinogen, it can create dependency, it can cause depression of vital signs. If not properly monitored, it can cause serious injury, life endangering consequences. Mrs. Kowalski on this day was challenging the staff to give her daughter a dose of 1,500 milligrams of ketamine. That is a big dose. That dose you're going to hear is several times, many times, the maximum dose that policies at all children's approve. You're going to hear Experts tell you that as many times any kind of safe dose. And you're going to hear the ER doctor who was on duty that day, Dr. Layla Behar Posey, who you're here from by deposition because unfortunately she's no longer with us, and I mean that in this life. She'll appear by deposition, and in, in her deposition you will hear her tell you what she did and why she did it. And you'll hear her tell you most pertinently that even if she was so inclined to give that much ketamine in the emergency room where she didn't have sufficient monitoring uh, availability, she didn't have the, the capacity for long-term wake-up and intubation she, for, for that t period of time, she didn't have the facility she needed to do that even if she was inclined to give it, which she wasn't, she couldn't safely do it in that setting. Now you're going to see that Dr. Behar Posey is not just a newbie out of medical school. You'll hear in her deposition what her qualifications are. You'll hear that she's board certified in pediatrics as well as emergency medicine. She's confronted a lot of patients, difficult patients, patients in extreme pain. You're going to hear that this patient, as far as she was concerned, had some degree of uniqueness in that she'd never seen anything quite like this, and she'd never heard of these doses of ketamine. What she found out, ultimately, and what, it, what developed over the next few days, and the, actually the next few weeks, is that Maya Kowalski had been given thousands thousands, tens of thousands of milligrams of ketamine over the preceding nine months. Her doctor, Dr. Hanna, had given her the day before admission 1,250 milligrams of ketamine. And at that time, he's going to testify to you that he told the mother he was no longer comfortable giving that much ketamine that it was too much for him to give in his outpatient clinic. And he actually sent her to all children's. 
you're going to hear that over the nine months preceding this, that he had given her a gradually increasing doses of ketamine, 12, 15, over 20 milligrams per kilogram per hour, which is dozens of times the safe and effective dose that was approved by the hospital and that is talked about by the FDA, and that it's never been written up in the literature. You'll hear Dr. Hanna say, either by deposition or by admission on that witness stand, that this was at or near the highest per capita dosage he had ever given any patient. It wasn't working. So what had happened was that he had maxed out with this ketamine dosage. He had sent her to all children's. And Mrs. Kowalski, despite what he had told her, despite what had happened over the last nine months, was demanding even more. Dr. Posey heard this story from the mother. She heard how much ketamine that the mother said Dr. Hannah was giving. giving. She heard what the mother was demanding. She saw what, what was going on with this child. She'll tell you what her suspicions were about the child's condition and what was actually causing it. But she called Dr. Hanna's office herself. Yeah. She learned that he gave 1,250 milligrams. She learned what else had happened the day before. And so she decided that she would attempt to stabilize the child. She literally, she'll tell you about literally negotiating with the mother to give a small dose of ketamine and some sedative to conduct an examination to admit the child to the pediatric intensive care unit. The, well, you'll hear it called the PICU. And to, the idea that she had at that time was, let's get her in the PICU Let's get her evaluated by pain management. Let's see what's really going on here. Let's get her stabilized. And then let's see if we can wean her down off all this medication she's been given. So she admitted her to the PICU. She, uh, and Maya Kowalski was taken up to the PICU floor. And that process, in fact, began after consultations were placed by the PICU staff to have, to have her see anesthesiology, pain management, and psychiatry, as well as to do some more diagnostic studies and blood workup. So what was being done here at this point? What was reasonably prudent with what these physicians knew and what they knew it? What was happening was that they had a child being given levels of medication that they had never heard of before, that the literature did not support, that the literature didn't even mention. And so they put her in a safe environment. They attempted to get her stabilized. They called the correct consultations, and they tried to investigate what was going on. We will suggest to you, the evidence will suggest, and the experts will say, that that was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. There's no conspiracy here. It was an effort to safeguard this child and to see that she got appropriate therapy going forward, whatever that happened to be. Now, you'll hear that the admission diagnosis that was recognized at that time by Dr. Behar Posey and ultimately by Dr. Tepa Sanchez was CRPS, chronic regional pain syndrome. There were other suspicions, and you'll hear about those too. But for now, I want you to focus on what CRPS allegedly has as its features according to Dr. Kirkpatrick and what you've just heard from Mr. Anderson. It's lifelong. It's incurable. It can wax and wane. It can return at any time for any reason or no reason at all. It can cause a whole host of symptoms. And according to Dr. Kirkpatrick, who's the one who, who diagnosed it to begin with, 
It's incurable. It's always going to recur. It always requires ketamine. Now, if there's any suggestion made that Dr. Kirkpatrick wanted to try alternative therapy first and had some regard for what the previous doctors had done, we're going to invite you to listen to the evidence about that and to look at the evidence about that and see how much was done, how much was actually attempted. The, uh, we believe the evidence is going to be that that wasn't something that was given a really fair, appropriate trial before ketamine was used. You're going to see, ultimately, Dr. Kirkpatrick, when this child was in the hospital in October and November of 2016, told Mrs. Kowalski that unless Maya Kowalski got more of his ketamine treatments, more of these high doses, that she would die a slow and painful death. Well, thankfully, he was wrong has been wrong so far. And we think he will continue to be wrong. At this point, it's well to walk the clock back a little bit. I want to ask you to look at the evidence <coughs> as, it, as you receive it on a comparative basis with these ideas in mind. You're going to hear, and you heard already, some recording from Dr. Kirkpatrick's first visit with Maya Kowalski and her family in uh, September, September 23rd to be exact, of 2015. I want to focus for a minute on her condition at that time, what the evidence will show that. She was wheelchair bound. Her legs had atrophied. You saw the picture that Mr. Anderson showed you. Her legs and arms were hypersensitive to touch. She had limited use of, most of, of her arms due to pain. You're going to see more of that. You're going to hear about pain in other parts of her body, alleged dystonian. She wasn't in school. She wasn't functional. She couldn't walk. She couldn't do her own ADLs. She had no normal function at that time you're going to hear evidence that she came to that point from several, from several admissions, primarily for asthma at all children, but they also concerned a number of admissions at other institutions. Now, Mr. Anderson has mentioned to you what the evidence is going to show about Lurie Children's Hospital, where she was taken by Mr. and Mrs. Kowalski, Tampa General Hospital, Sarasota Memorial Hospital. She had been seen as an outpatient by the first physicians group here in Sarasota, or the Sarasota Memorial Group. She had seen uh, some physicians from Lee County. There was over 40 specialists that she had seen before she found her way to Dr. Kirkpatrick's office. And all of those specialists, many of those specialists that weren't concerned primarily with asthma, felt that in her presentation, some of the work, work seeing her for asthma, felt that in her presentation there was some psychogenic component of some sort. And there were words like conversion disorder, psychological component. There was even one at that early point who was concerned about Munchausen by proxy. What I'm suggesting to you is all children didn't blaze this trail, we just walked it. We found it on our own, but we walked it. So did these other folks, all 40 of them. And actually, the number is about 48. The point is, that was not an unreasonable thing for Johns Hopkins to ultimately come around to believing and come around to suspecting, because many others had suspected the same thing. The... Uh, Recommendations for treatment of this disease, of the diseases that were suspected before Dr. Kirkpatrick, were physical therapy, psychological and cognitive behavioral therapy, sustained, long-term, intensive. That was back then. That's pretty much the therapy that Dr. Kirkpatrick rejected. 
because he began the course of, of ketamine. When Dr. Kirkpatrick saw her on September 23rd, he didn't, you'll hear him say, I believe. He didn't care what the other doctors said. He didn't care what the records showed. He didn't review the records. He never contacted them. He never talked to them. There was no discussion in which he said, gee, I think it's this. I'm a specialist in this. You're a specialist in pediatrics. Let's reconcile our differences of opinion. Didn't do that. Instead, he diagnosed chronic regional pain syndrome. He's the first one to do it. And he began therapy, ketamine therapy. Now, you, you heard counsel talk about what the evidence is going to show Dr. Dr. Kirkpatrick did. Dr. Kirkpatrick is, will, will say in this courtroom or by deposition one that he began this child on a, on a four-day treatment of high-dose ketamine, what he considered to be high-dose. You're going to hear, incidentally, that Dr. Hannah's high doses were multiple times what she was given by Dr. Kirkpatrick. He gave her four days, four consecutive days of ketamine, and his records say that there was minimal effect. Minimal effect. He used opioids and narcotics try to control her pain after those treatments. And we believe the evidence will show that as a result of those things, she wound up at All Children's Hospital with stomach pain and horrendous constipation. That was going to happen again and again following large doses of ketamine and other drugs. She was being harmed by those things. But in September, and then in October, when Dr. Kirkpatrick treated her with high-dose ketamine, he prescribed more yet. And so she went to Mexico to see Dr. Cantu. Um, I'm glad to hear Dr. Cantu is going to be here. But Dr. Cantu, in his deposition, described to us what his regimen of ketamine consisted of down in Monterey. It's a treatment that is not approved in this country. It, he developed it from a trial in Germany. He'll tell you that. It contemplates giving the patient seven to up to nine milligrams per kilogram per hour for several days and keeping them in a coma with intubation for that period of time. He's going to tell you that it's a risky procedure. He's going to tell you that he tells his patients that there is a 50% risk of death from that procedure. Now he's going to say he's never lost anybody, but listen to the cross-examination of Dr. Cantu about the dangers of that treatment, the degree of ketamine that was used, how it was used, and what his expectations of success were, because those expectations were not realized. And that's a key factor, because what is going to happen here is that this child was given the same thing over and over and over and over again in increasing quantities, and it didn't work. And the first thing that didn't ultimately work was Dr. Cantu's treatment. She had to go back down to Mexico for a ketamine booster. Dr. Cantu will tell you that that's fairly usual, that, that happens and that then he expects them to be pain-free for a number of weeks or months. Listen to what Dr. Cantu tells you about whether he knew anything about what happened after this. Because what happened after this was Maya Kowalski was taken back to this country. She was taken to see Dr. Hanna. Dr. Hanna embarked on a course of ketamine treatment beginning in January of 2016 and extending to the door of all children on October 7, 2016. Nine months of therapy, 55 treatments, 
an average of one a week or more. 55 treatments of ketamine multiple, multiple times in excess, not just of what the doses pres uh, recommended by the manufacturers were, not just in excess of those, not just in excess of Johns Hopkins All Children's Policy, multiple times in excess of what Dr. Kirkpatrick gave, multiple times in excess of what Dr. Cantu gave. You may even hear Dr. Cantu admit that he wouldn't give those doses in the circumstances that Dr. Hanna did. You may hear him say that he, did, he never gave them, period. But all those doses of ketamine and all that therapy and all those drugs over that nine months, over that 13 months, we're going to ask you to look at the evidence and look at what the evidence shows about the result. The evidence shows that as of this, uh, October 7th, 2016, once again, Maya Kowalski is wheelchair bound. She's hypersensitive. She's unable to use her arms and legs. She's got chronic extreme complaints of pain. She's got leg atrophy and said to have dystonia. And in that year, incidentally, she gained four pounds. Think about that. You're going to hear more about that. Because Dr. Hanna will tell you that he recognized that his patient was malnourished. Over that period of time, over a year, she gained four pounds. Now, she also, at All Children's, was on 21 different medications as of October 7, 2016. 21 different medications. Let's compare for a moment what the evidence shows regarding Maya Kowalski's condition at the time of her first appointment with Dr. Kirkpatrick and the time she's admitted to all children's a year later. You can see the slot. The evidence will show that she was in essentially the same condition with one addition. In addition to the problem she was having when she saw Dr. Kirkpatrick back in September 2015, in addition, she was malnourished. You'll also hear evidence that during that same period of time, there were three occasions, October 7th was the fourth, when she was in the emergency room complaining of extreme stomach pain following doses, high doses of ketamine and other drugs. We suggest to you the evidence will show that she was being harmed by these large doses of medication. The evidence will show you that the doctor's concern about how much she was being given and the frequency with which she was being given it was very well placed and is vindicated by what happened later. Let's take that comparison one step further. We believe the evidence is going to show you that between the time that Maya Kowalski was seen on October 7th in the, in the ACH emergency room, and the time she was discharged three months later. She had gained four and a half pounds, which is more than she had gained a net weight gain in the last year before admission. She was still in a wheelchair, but she wasn't complaining of extreme pain constantly. She was comfortable. She was using her arms and we believe she was improved. There will be evidence you hear from the witness stand about her condition at the time of discharge versus her condition at the time of admission. But perhaps more telling is the condition under which she was discharged. At that time, 
she went from 21 medications down to three. And at that time, she began a course of physical therapy and counseling that, by the following school year, had her back in school. That was pretty much the regimen that was recommended for her at all children's. That was pretty much the regimen that could have been given her earlier and sustained and perhaps saved her a lot of anguish and pain and perhaps this loss. Uh, she got her physical therapy. She got counseling. Pain medications were withdrawn. You may very well hear that to this day she's on no pain medication. Now you heard it suggested by counsel that she couldn't take ketamine. Indeed, when she was discharged, the court, this court, the court of this circuit, not this judge. Jackson. That basis. What's the legal basis? <coughs> Motion to eliminate. I don't recall that one. Continue. Directed her discharge. She could not be discharged without, without an order of the court. And she was discharged with instructions as to what medication she could have at that time. She could not have ketamine. She could not have anal heavy analgesics without the court's intervention. That matter was dismissed several months later after she did well in her father's custody. And she's free to get whatever she wants today. But for the present, let me just mention this. I'll deal more with it. You're going to hear a lot more about it. Once the court entered an order following a report of child abuse that she was to be sheltered at all children's under the custody of the Department of Children and Families. All Children's Hospital did not have the ability to discharge her without court approval, even if it wanted to. You're going to hear evidence. You're going to hear evidence from DCF personnel who will tell you we're the ones that set the visitation parameters. We're the ones that decreed who she could see, when she could see them, what she could have, what she could have in her room, what she would have access to. The hospital, unfortunately, was put in the position of having to implement those orders. That's what we tried to do. But throughout this case, we're going to ask you to try to avoid conflating what was done by the court or ordered by the court with what was done by the hospital because the hospital is not the court. The hospital is not DCF. The hospital has to follow that and the hospital doesn't institute that. The court and DCF do. Now, I digress a little bit there, but I want you to look, I want you to pay attention, I'm sure you will, to what the evidence will show regarding Maya Kowalski's condition today. If she's not at the head of her class at Venice High School, she's real close. She served in her student government. She works out. She's on track to get a high school diploma and an AA degree on time. She's dating. She's functional. She walks unassisted. She's not taking pain medication. To, 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 to some appearance, she's doing very well, and we hope it stays that way. Now let's walk back the clock once again to uh, October 7th, 2017. At that time, we described what kind, somewhat, what happened in the emergency room. You're going to hear more about that from uh, nurse witnesses. Uh, Maya Kowalski was admitted to the PICU. We talked about that. Dr. Beatrice Tepa Sanchez was the one on duty that night. You'll see what her credentials were. She'll tell you what her, what her credentials are and her board certification in pediatrics and intensive medicine. She will tell you that what she did was attempt to understand what was going on with this child. And you'll see her, and you'll hear her walk through her admission history and physical. 
and the research that she did into the records that were available to her at All Children's of previous encounters. You'll see her discharge summary, and you'll see the care that she took to track down what this patient's history was. And you'll see that when she did that, and she was able to get the child admitted and, st and, and sedated and started stabilizing, that she did call appropriate consultations. She did get pain management and anesthesiology involved. She did call psychiatry. And because of her concern, you'll hear that she also called a pediatric child abuse expert, Dr. Sally Smith. Doc you'll hear Dr. Smith is the head, the medical director of the child protection team, the CPT, for DCF, the Division of Family Services, or excuse me, the Division uh, Department of Children and Families. I just, I just gave away my age, by the way. <coughs> they used to call it the 70s. But in any event, you'll hear that she contacted Dr. Smith to say, basically, I'm not sure what's going on here. Can you check this out? And you'll hear that Dr. Smith did. You'll hear that Dr. Smith was not an employee of all children's hospitals. She was not part of the treatment team, but she was there as a resource. And you'll see over time, and we'll talk about this again in a minute, the investigation that she conducted in connection with her duties with DCF and the child protection team. She was not an employee of all children's and never held herself out as such. And you may hear from Mr. and Mrs. Kowalski themselves that they knew that from, the, from day one. Now, I mentioned that uh, Dr. Tepa Sanchez got her colleagues involved. One of those colleagues you'll hear from is Dr. Richard Elliott. Dr. Elliott is a, a board certified anesthesiology uh, in pediatrics. Uh, he will be here and testify about what he, he found, what his interactions with Ms. Kowalski were, and how he believed this child needed to be weaned off of high-dose medication and weaned off of the regimen that she had been on. Uh, you'll also hear from Dr. Jenny Dolan. She's in the same discipline. She, too, had interactions. And you'll hear from both those doctors that... During the time they were caring for this patient, they were having a problem with what Mrs. Kowalski wanted. Mrs. Kowalski wanted an intrathecal pain pump placed in her daughter's spine to deliver a medication called clonidine, a powerful drug, into her spine, spinal canal. She was told that was a bad idea by the doctors at All Children's. She was told the same thing by doctors at Nemours. Indeed, you're going to hear Dr. Kirkpatrick tell her that's a bad idea. She was insistent upon asking for that over and over. She was talking about taking her daughter back to Mexico and Italy for more high-dose ketamine that she had just come off of and that the doctors at all children's felt weren't working and frankly we would suggest that the evidence suggests weren't working. The plan of care that the doctors wanted to pursue was consultation, weaning of the medications, appropriate care, and ultimately transfer. Now I'm going to Let's go past the slide on Dr. Smith here and, and, and go fast forward here because I want to talk about several specific allegations that have to do with the sequence of events from this point forward in the case and what the evidence is going to show you about that sequence of events. This child was admitted with a consent form agreeing to treatment signed off by Mr. Kowalski on October 7th of 2016. By that Monday, by that Sunday, the family, particularly Mrs. Kowalski, wanted to leave. They were being dissuaded from that. They'll tell you 
that on the morning of October 10th or 11th, that they were told they couldn't leave. I'm going to invite you to listen to what the evidence will show about that encounter. We believe the evidence will show, and you hear Mr. Kowalski say that no one ever told him he could not leave all children's hospital. We believe the evidence will also show that at that time, with the threats being made by the mother to find more high-dose, dangerous ketamine, that it was reasonable and warranted for the doctors to decline that if they had chosen to do so. We don't believe they did. We think that the evidence is more persuasive and shows you that there was a convocation of folks on the morning of October 10th or 11th at which there was a discussion of the plan, there was a discussion of the weaning, there was a discussion of stabilization, the plan being let's get her weaned off this medication safely and then let's transfer her to an institution where more intensive physical therapy, more intensive behavioral therapy, and more intensive occupational therapy is available. The evidence will show you that All Children's Hospital was not trying to, to imprison this young lady. We were trying to get her stabilized and transfer to somewhere where she could get the help that she needed. And you're going to see that that somewhere was identified by Dr. Michelle Smith and others as Nemours Children's Hospital. A brief look at Dr. Smith's qualifications. You're going to hear from her from the witness stand. Dr. Smith is presently our chief of staff. She's also a board certified pediatrician and intensivist. She came into this case on October 9th and she virtually from the outset began discussing with Mrs. Kowalski transfer of the patient. Now, there's her plan of care. That's what she wanted to pursue. And she tried to get it done with a transfer from PICU to PICU to Nemours. She felt at the time that if she transferred the child to Nemours, the intensive pain management program could begin while the child was still the, an inpatient. The Moors declined the transfer. She didn't stop though. So I'm going to skip past this slide because we pretty much covered it. She didn't stop. After that discussion at which the family agreed to stay, and you're going to see multiple sources of documentation of that, after that discussion, she took it upon herself to call on the Moors again. And she called a doctor named Vizgelia Santana Rojas. You're going to hear that Dr. Santana Rojas, and you're going to hear from her, we believe, by Zoom. You're going to hear Dr. Santana Rojas verify what she was told, or what she told Mrs. Kowalski, and what Dr. Smith will say she told Mrs. Kowalski. And that's basically this. She said that Nemours wouldn't take a transfer for inpatient, but that Dr. Santana Rojas operated an outpatient pain management clinic, specializing in pediatrics because that's all Nemours does, just like all children. All we treat is pediatrics. All they treat is pediatrics. In their pain management program, they treat CRPS. You'll hear Dr. Santana Rojas describe that she told Mrs. Kowalski that. You'll hear her say that she was asked by Mrs. Kowalski, if I go over there, if I come to your program, will you put in an intrathecal pain pump? And Dr. Santana Rojas said, no, we won't do that. That's not part of our program. That's dangerous. It's against your, your daughter's interest. But what we will do, without ketamine, without analgesic, what we will do is give her intensive physical, occupational, 
and behavioral therapy, and I'm going to replicate with her the program I trained in at Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. I've replicated that program here, and we're getting very good results. If you bring your daughter over here as an outpatient, we'll put her in our program. You hear Dr. Smith pretty much tell you the same thing. I'm not sure what Dr. Santana Rojas is going to say about this, but I know what Dr. Smith is going to say. And it's this. Dr. Smith left the hospital that day thinking she had a deal. She thought, okay, we're going to get this child weaned and stable and then we're going to transfer her as an outpatient in her family's custody to Nemours, pain management. Now, as you hear the evidence come in, you are going to see that this, at this point, on October 11, 2016, there had been a report accepted to DCF, there had been an investigation started, but nothing really had taken place. There had not been a dependency petition filed. There had been no court order. The court hadn't denied the Kowalski's access to their daughter. They hadn't done anything. At this point, on October 11th, all Children's <coughs> Hospital and its staff were attempting to facilitate Mr. and Mrs. Kowalski taking their daughter out of All Children's Hospital in their custody and taking her as an outpatient for treatment at the morgue. We suggest to you that if that had happened, we would not be together today. We su we're going to suggest to you that the evidence will show that if that had happened, it's reasonable to think that none of this would have occurred. We believe that had that occurred, this entire matter could have been sidetracked and never, and never brought us together. But that's not what happened. Because the next morning, when Dr. Smith arrived back at the hospital, she found that Mrs. Kowalski wanted to take Maya Kowalski to Dr. Hannah for more ketamine, that she wanted to seek an intrathecal pain catheter elsewhere, that she wanted to obtain more ketamine elsewhere, and that there was still discussion of Mexico or Italy. Shortly after that, there was a shelter order. At that point, the circumstances under which Maya was a patient at All Children's were not dictated by the hospital, they were dictated by the court and DCF. Now, the situation proceeded with the weaning completed at All Children's. All Children's, the evidence will show, attempted to get this child the physical therapy on an inpatient basis that it could provide. We didn't think it was enough, but we did what we could. She got some behavioral therapy, although not the kind that she needed. We didn't have it available. That's why we wanted to transfer her. But you'll see as you go forward and you hear witness after witness and you look in the hospital chart, you're going to see that over and over and over again, we weren't warehousing this child voluntarily. You'll see it noted over and over. Medically cleared for discharge awaiting court disposition. At the close of all the evidence, we'll tote up for you the number of times that appears in the record. But we're going to suggest to you the evidence is going to be conclusive that there was never any false imprisonment of this child at All Children's Hospital. Now, I want to talk before I get into disease versus syndrome and problems with diagnosis. I want to talk about a couple other things. One is the matter of, of a battery. 
and the surveillance. We believe the evidence is going to show you that whenever there was a touching of Maya Kowalski, it was done for therapeutic or clinical reasons or to comfort a child. There was never any intent to do her any harm. There was never any intent to be offensive or harmful. And we believe that at the end of all the evidence, you're going to find that there was never any point at which a reasonable person would have taken offense at how she was touched and how her care was managed in that regard. Um, we need to talk a minute about the problems with diagnosis here. Um, you're going to hear a lot about CRPS, conversion disorder, a number of other things. CRPS and conversion disorder and these mental diagnoses have, have a couple of things that are significant about it. One is that they aren't diseases in the sense that doctors use that term concretely. A disease is something that you can see and you can diagnose and there isn't any question about it. Appendicitis. Most forms of cancer. There's the lab test that proves it or disproves it. If you have HIV, there's a lab test for it. If you have appendicitis, there's an imaging study that shows a hot appendix. Objective. Syndromes aren't like that. In a syndrome, you piece together a constellation of symptoms and a constellation of findings, and it's much more subjective. And that's why we have things like the Budapest criteria that Council talked about and you're going to hear a lot about that going forward. In this particular case, you're going to hear that there was a good deal of controversy about what this diagnosis was. When this patient came in to, to all children's, we did, in fact, admit her with a diagnosis of CRPS. And we continued to bill for that and to, to treat that, and we tried to transfer her with that diagnosis. But as time went on, for the same reason that CRPS was not suspected at Tampa General or at Lurie's or elsewhere, we questioned the diagnosis. And while the diagnosis was carried forward as a rule out, it was not the, the discharge diagnosis, although we noted in the discharge summary that it was never ruled out. Now, the uh, you're going to hear much about CRPS, but I'm going to skip past this slide because we kind of covered this. You are going to hear a lot about CRPS's rarity, and you're going to hear a lot of reasons given why we didn't believe this is CRPS. One reason was that it was presenting as a general pain syndrome involving the entire body. Well, what's the name of the the name of the syndrome? Chronic regional pain syndrome doesn't usually present as whole body. You're going to hear that's vanishingly rare, if not almost unheard of. You're also going to hear that there are various presentation factors about this disease that were never really observed on a consistent basis, like decrease of hair loss, nail, nail changes, skin asymmetric tissue cha uh, changes in the skin. A lot of these observations about CRPS just weren't consistently present. There were, however, re reasons to suspect conversion disorder. Now, now we've arrived at psychiatric or psychological issues. There's a lot of misconceptions about psychology and psychiatry and mental illness. And people act like saying, it's conversion disorder, or it's all in your head, is some kind of epitaph. It's an insult. And that's not the case. When these doctors were writing down conversion disorder, they weren't trying to insult somebody. They were trying to attach a suspicion and a diagnosis to get a patient the help they needed. No one's telling this patient she doesn't have pain. What they're saying is that what their question is what's causing it and what you do about it. 
And that's the central issue here in many respects because this entire case revolves around not so much what the diagnosis is, but what the clinical treatment is. I've got a slide here in a minute that will show you that, show you this, that I'll probably skip when we get to it because now I'm taking it out of order because as usual in an opening statement, I'm way off the reservation from what I'm supposed to be doing in, in order. But since it, uh, it's appropriate, I'll, I'll say it here. When you look and when you hear what the evidence is about the reasonable standard of care treatment for CRPS, for conversion disorder, for a pain syndrome manifesting by Mun as Munchausen by proxy, for factitious disorder manifesting as a pain syndrome. When you hear what the treatment is, the clinical treatment is for all those things, same thing. Maybe the mix differs, but it's basically physical therapy, occupational therapy, and psychological or cognitive behavioral therapy. Those are the treatments. And you're going to hear from experts who treat this, this disease day in, day out, and these diseases, I should say, all of them, day in, day out, and they do it without putting the patient in a coma, without giving the patient... 15, 20 times the, the recommended dose of ketamine over months and months and months. They do it by therapy, and the results they get are stellar. And you'll hear that from them. You're, you'll also hear that for that same set of reasons, this business about billing just isn't supported by the evidence. You're going to see the billing records. You're going to see the billing sheets. You're going to see that CRPS was an item. It was one of a number of items that was being billed for. You're going to hear that there was no change in the medical reimbursement for the billing as a result of where, in what place, whether it's 1 or 12, and that's literally how many diagnoses there were that points in this, whether it was the first diagnosis or the sixth or the eighth or the tenth, you're going to hear that the billing reimbursement never changed. And the reason for that was that while you needed a diagnosis to put on that code, what was really being billed for was the services rendered. And you'll see the billing sheets and the services that are laid out item by item, and you'll see that those didn't change either. You'll also hear that none of this cost Mr. Kowalski a dime. And you're also here that the insurer who was billed for the services rendered by All Children's Hospital for three months of inpatient therapy, the insurer never complained. Didn't say a word. Approved the care, approved the billing. No problem. Now, you're going to hear a lot about Munchausen by proxy. And I'm going to kind of fast forward through this for one reason, that, that we're running a little bit low on time. But the other reason is that it's a very technical thing and it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't merit near the attention that it's gotten because it's been a flashpoint throughout this. There was a suspicion of Munchausen by proxy. It wasn't just all children's suspicion. There was a concern that part of this child's condition was being fostered or encouraged by the mother. There was a concern that the mother was seeking out care that was too aggressive, that was dangerous, and would persist in doing so if she were permitted to do so. That's what got this ball rolling. And I told you a few minutes ago what the evidence will show about the attempt to transfer for outpatient care, why it failed, and why as a result of that these investigations rolled forward. The 
this is a slide I told you I'm going to, I'm going to skip because this talks about what the, what the therapy is and how it is all of them. We talked about billing fraud, so I'm going to skip over this slide as well. Let me talk about photographs for a minute. You've heard about the photos that were taken. These photos were taken for clinical reasons. We believe the evidence will show you that they were taken pursuant to the consent that Mr. Kowalski signed when he, he was admitted, and which he will, he will, I believe, admit to you he never rescinded. The purpose of the, of the photos was to document the condition of the child. If there were skin lesions, even if they were not being documented in the, in the nursing notes, they needed to be documented, they needed to be observed if they got worse. If there were new ones being developing, we need to know that too. But the point is that they were, they were being taken to assist in diagnosis and follow the, follow the child's condition. You heard about surveillance, the movie, surveillance video. You're going to hear that that wasn't a new idea either. That also happened at Tampa Channel. Why was it done? because medical professionals wanted to know what the child's capabilities were. Now, that video is going to tell you a couple, you're going to see, uh, we're not going to ask you to watch 42 hours of video. But you're going to see grabs from that video that show several things from our standpoint. You're going to hear some <coughs> the plaintiff walks. From our standpoint, you're going to see in that video Maya Kowalski, who's saying her legs are hypersensitive and can't be touched, saying she can't move her legs, is moving her legs in bed, moving her legs into a position that we used to call Indian style, and now we call crisscross applesauce. She was able to assume that position and hold that position voluntarily and without a problem. You're also going to see and get some idea of the fact that she was not in that room for 42 hours. You'll see it, that she's in and out. She went to therapy, she went to other places. And you'll see the nurses coming and going and assisting her when indicated to the commode. The commode wasn't placed out of her reach for any kind of malicious purpose. It was placed in the position that it was because she had nursing staff available to help her, as you'll see they did. And because if you put it too close or in too, too close position to the bedside, it would obstruct the nurse's ability to get to the bed. It was strictly a matter of happenstance. It was not a matter of intent. And that brings me to another point, and it's on this slide. You're not going to hear any evidence that the 50-some-odd medical, medical doctors and professionals who took care of Maya Kowalski over three months somehow banded together in some sort of cabal and hatched a plot or a conspiracy to do harm. You're just not going to hear that. You're instead going to hear from a constellation of dedicated pediatricians and dedicated specialists who were genuinely trying to do the right thing for this patient. They may have differed in, in some opinions with the family, but their uppermost objective was to keep this child safe and to get this child the therapy and the treatment that she needed. Now, why was the diagnosis an issue if the treatment was the same? That's a reasonable question. Let me suggest that the evidence is and will be that the importance of the diagnosis is the result of the fact that that, that CRPS diagnosis was being used to justify dangerous care, dangerous levels of ketamine, levels of ketamine and other drugs that aren't even recognized in the literature. Those doctors weren't going to come get the patient. Family was going to take the patient to those doctors. 
And so it was important to get the diagnosis straight and the treatment straight so that the right mix of therapy could be formulated and the, the best job could be done to get Maya Kowalski into a position of being comfortable, functional, and lead a happy and healthy life. That's what we were attempting to do. There's never an intent, an intent to do anything but that. Um, over the next few weeks, we think you're going to hear a number of experts in the courtroom. We'll be bringing in experts from California and elsewhere. They're going to talk to you about whether or not the overarching allegation against all children's and its physicians, including even Sally Smith, that they were negligent in Maya Kowalski's care and that their negligence somehow caused injury. We're going to suggest to you that, first of all, there was no ultimate injury caused given the condition that she was given to us in. But more importantly, there was no deviation from the standard of care. You're going to hear from different doctors in different specialties that the care that was taken in diagnosing and treating Maya Kowalski, you're going to hear about teams of consultants, you're going to hear about meticulous investigations, you can see that Sally Smith formulated a 45-page single-space report of her review of literally thousands of medical records to come up with her diagnosis, you're going to see a lot of effort and care and expertise went in to the effort made to treat this child at, at, at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. We believe that the evidence will be unequivocal that that degree of effort, insight, investigation, and monitoring and care comported in every respect with what is reasonable and what is recognized as being reasonable and appropriate by other similar physicians. And we don't believe you're going to hear any credible evidence otherwise. You heard the judge give you a, a, a definition of medical negligence. I just kind of paraphrased it. But the point I'm making to you is that the evidence will ultimately show that these doctors and these nurses and this hospital staff acted reasonably and prudently to treat a difficult and challenging case they were presented with, and they did it consistently over three months. They don't have to be right under the law. All they have to be is reasonable. And we will suggest to you that the evidence will show that first, they probably were right, but even if they weren't, they were more than reasonable. At the end of all this, at the end of all the evidence, I'll have another chance to visit with you or my colleague, Mr. Shapiro, will. Uh, you're going to hear a lot between now and then. And again, I appreciate very much your, your uh, attentiveness and your diligence, as does my client and people at uh, All Children's Hospital. I thank you for your attention and look forward to working with you in the next few weeks. And you'll be pleased to know I skipped at least three slides. Thank you. <laughs> May I see uh, one of the lawyers from each side, please? Members of the jury, we're going to be letting you go here in a few moments. Um, first thing, and, and Debbie Coley, I told you I was going to give you all a telephone number, so Debbie Coley will give that out to you. This is so you can give to you know, a spouse or 
you know, anyone that might need to get a hold of you in an emergency. Um, so he'll give that to you uh, as you go. Now, was there anyone, I know I asked at the beginning of the morning, was there anyone that had an update relative to any sort of issue? Is there a, a note that you can send to me or? Everything's fine? Glad to hear that. Okay. Well, well, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Okay, tomorrow we're gonna start evidence. Um, I'm gonna ask the deputy to, to tell you exactly, you know where to go, uh, but at the same time, um, arrival that you did today you need tomorrow because my goal is to bring in at exactly at nine o'clock and we'll start uh, evidence remember do not discuss this case amongst yourselves do not do any investigation and receive no information and with that if you could follow the deputy who will uh, let you get out of here All right, sir. Thank you. Uh, leave your your notes just put it in the red well and we will take custody of them tonight. Yep. Yeah, leave them on the chairs. There's a number on there. This isn't our first rodeo. Okay, uh, the jury is out of our presence. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, when we were talking, there was some discussion about the possibility that you all wanted to spend some time with me this afternoon, but it was unclear. Um, so do you all need to have hearing time this afternoon, or do you want time to start working on your presentations for, and questionings for tomorrow? Both. <laughs> we're not going to be able to do that. Uh, Judge, we, we have a lot of work to do. But uh, we would like to know if there's a way to time it so that we can send over the exhibits we intend to put in to both the court and opposing counsel within the next few hours. And then if there's going to be some objection or some, something, uh, if there's any possible way of either later on today or tomorrow, I'm happy to come in and bring witness after witness and spend the time on the... Uh, on foundation predicate and so forth, but it's a colossal waste of time for things like photographs and, and, and most of the other records. Okay, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. I'm asking for the court's uh, advice and direction in terms of getting in our expert, our uh, in a procedure for getting our exhibits in tomorrow in the most efficient way. I would like to provide defense counsel with a list of them pronto and require them to get back with any specific objections or stipulations so that I know by the end of the day how to time my case in terms of asking for a foundation predicate introduction questions to my witnesses. So and you mean like which specific uh, exhibit you're going to tell them? Because I, I, my understanding is we've got 80 something binders of exhibits here that yeah. you all have submitted. And so some are agreed to and others are not. Correct. So the not agreed to ones, I think what the court will find is the vast majority of the exhibits are medical records. But when it came to most of our case, the photographs, videotapes, the recordings, various notes, letters, anything else other than medical records, there are objections. Except I don't know what the basis is for those objections and we've never had a chance to talk about it. We had representations that we would get those back. We still don't know what their position is on it. We have trimmed down three times our exhibit list at the court's suggestion, at council's suggestion. We have provided responses already to propose to what we think may be an, uh, an objection. What time are you suggesting that you're gonna actually let the defense know what exhibits you intend to use tomorrow? 3.30, 4, 4. 4 o'clock would be good. And if we would know back by 5, I mean, Judge, these I, things have been around for years, years and years. Well, Mr. Anderson, it's, it's the same issue we've been having over and over and over again. At, until you tell them specifically what you're doing, you can't ask them to say, there's 4,000 exhibits, tell us which ones you have an objection to. You, you can't do that. So. I'm not hearing Mr. Whitney say four o'clock, and then you want them to return in an hour. So, I mean, it would seem to me like 
you really should be telling them, just like with the witnesses, by lunchtime, and, and maybe you can't do it today, but really in the future, perhaps what we need to do is by lunchtime, coming back from lunch, letting them, the other side, know, because that's what we're doing with witnesses. And I then, understand. So are you able to do it before 4 o'clock today? Yes, and I want to emphasize to the court, we're not talking about a, a vast amount. I would say 30, we don't know yet, but I was estimating 30 to 35, and these are photographs and things that are going in through the witnesses tomorrow. Well, again, to the extent that you're going to be using them, the earlier you can tell the other side, the earlier you're going to get a response. I, I mean, it's just as simple as that. And, and is it possible, Judge, that... I? I know everybody likes argument on these things, and that is required if asked, but is there any way that if we can receive back concise objections, that the court can be informed and we can provide the court with either the base number or email over to you the actual exhibits, not, you know, it's the photograph, just a Xerox of it, however the court would like it, so that you would be advised, we would have the objection, and for those, hopefully they stipulate most of them, for those that they don't, the court would be pre-prepared and could perhaps let us know if we need you know, more time or what. I just want to take advantage of the time I have and not waste it. Ms. Carlos. Thank you, Your Honor. I think I just addressed briefly the criticism of the defense. They've never narrowed the witnesses down. There's still 787. Beyond that, their photographs, instead of all he did was make them composite exhibit, but there's hundreds of them. So, and, and we most likely will be objecting to the audio recordings. We have told them that over and over again. And we have indicated on our, their exhibit list what our objections are. Hearsay, 403. I mean, I don't know what they mean by the specific objections. These are our objections. So we're happy to look at the 30 exhibits, if there's really 30 and not 300, 30 exhibits they send over today, and again advise them one way or the other if we will agree or not agree, happy to do that. If they want to send us 30 exhibits and say these are the ones we want to use tomorrow, we will review them and give them our response. Well, on a going forward basis, and, and this goes for, for both sides, please by the time we come back from lunch, tell the other side the witnesses you're going to be using and the exhibits you're going to be using on the following day. Now, for purposes of today, uh, Mr. Anderson, get whatever you can over as soon as you can, and the defense, I'm sure, will get it to you. But it sounds like if it's not going to be in time for me to convene a hearing this afternoon on it if you don't get them over and so it sounds like tomorrow, so what time? If I am here at 8.30, that gives us 30 minutes of time before the jury. What I do not want to have happen is the jury sitting in the back room because we didn't have our ducks in a row. So if we need to start earlier than 8.30, I'd rather start earlier than 8.30 so that the jury does not get inconvenienced. Can we remain in touch with the court? We don't want to over underestimate. Can we remain in touch with the court and can we uh, by email, I know your rule, uh, can we keep the court apprised by each side sending in for us the exhibits, them the objections and our estimate of the time? Judge, if we don't get them till four, I don't, I don't know. Well, I mean, I thought you all were going to get the script to me around five o'clock and it was 9.15 last night. And, I understand. I was a trial attorney, too. I, I understand you have a tremendous amount of things going on. It's just um, I'm concerned that you're not going to get things in time for us to have a hearing this afternoon. So I think it's going to have to be tomorrow morning. I, I am fine reviewing things ahead of time like I did with the things that were tendered last night. Um, and to the extent that I need to respond like I did last night, I will respond and we'll use that email address that we used last night. But I do not want this to become a daily habit where I'm having to email correspondence with you all at 10 o'clock at night. I, I just don't think that's good for anyone. 
So I, I would try to avoid doing it like that. So what time do you realistically think, Mr. Whitney, that you can get them? <laughs> since, since I know Mr. Anderson's uh, asking, uh, writing checks off of your back, so. Uh, 5 p.m. is fine, and, and I understand an hour for them to respond is not reasonable, but if we could get a response, that's about four hours for us. If they could have four hours and get us responses by 9 o'clock, and then we can have some hearing time in the morning. Is there any way I can get you to give to them by, like, 3 which is two hours, 15 minutes from now. Can we do it in a couple tranches? We'll give them as many as possible by three and then follow up, and if a half hour later, we've got a few more. How do you want this for us? Judge, I, I don't know that it matters. I think ultimately, we're gonna need some hearing time in the morning. I think that, I, I don't think we should bother the court with it overnight. I think we'll exchange what we can exchange. We'll come in in the morning. You'll know which ones we object to when we have a 30 minute hearing. Well, so you're okay with them sending them in, in waves? Yes, sir. Okay, so send them in waves to the extent that you can. What time, uh, Mr. Altenburn, you look like you need to say something. There, there are a couple. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm happy to work on jury instructions when, with the convenience of the court. A lot of that looks like it can wait. I'm thinking day. Wednesday uh, morning is probably. A good time. Or sometime on Wednesday. But the openings caused me to have a couple of concerns, and I would be happy to file a, a, you know, a brief memo so that we could have that early on. But the, the two concerns are, uh, first, that they, they began their opening, and they've talked a lot about the period in 2015 before October 7th, and, and discussions that suggest to me that they're thinking of proving a malpractice for failure to diagnose them. And that's not pled. It would have been outside the statute of limitations if it had been filed. And so I just don't want to start having a case going forward on evidence of something that is, that is not really an issue within the, the pleadings. And, and the second thing is that it appears from their, their strategy of not discussing the DCF proceeding hardly at all that, that it's no longer that we cause DCF to have bad visiting policies and I guess the orders become sort of an affirmative defense now from this, which is fine with me if we have it as an affirmative defense. I just need to kind of understand how we're going to be going forward on the Chapter 39 issues that seem to take a different twist this morning than I was envisioning. Given Mr. Elliott's motion um, about 10 days ago, I kind of assumed that that was their change. Well, I wasn't certain whether that was their change or how they were going forward, but now it's clear. <laughs> So, okay, so how much time tomorrow do we need? Do I start court at 8.30? Do I start at 8.15? Do I start at... 8.15 probably would be best. And then, because the jury's got, with the goal of getting the jury in at 9. I want, I want the jury walking in this door at 9 a.m. I'd say 8.15. That's fine, too. Let's go over the schedule again. Uh, Friday is uh, in is a day that we're having uh, witnesses. Monday is a religious holiday, so the court will be closed on Monday. We will have evidence on Tuesday. We might have legal arguments on Wednesday morning, but no jury on Wednesday, and we will have a jury with us on Thursday and Friday. So next week. We'll have a jury with us Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Okay. One other uh, note, as far as the Zoom and the rule of sequestration, technically I don't think either side has actually um, invoked it, but I assume one side is. Uh, you're, you're invoking it? Yes, and I have a couple of corollaries to that when the court's ready. Okay, well, let me finish. The way I'm running Zoom for the security settings, I don't have any control over who comes in. Right. So if you all are going to invoke the rule of sequestration, you have to, and I'm going to specifically direct each side to tell your witnesses that they are prohibited from monitoring the trial. So are we invoking the rule of sequestration? 
plaintiff's moved to invoke the rule. Okay. Two corollaries to it, one well known, uh, the other one I think the case law supports. Uh, uh, Kyle Kowalski is a beneficiary, uh, traditionally are treated as uh, uh, parties for the purposes of the rule. Uh, so I'm hoping there won't be any problem with him staying in. We didn't invoke the rule, Judge. I'm sorry? We didn't invoke the rule. Well, if the, if the rule's been invoked, then Kyle Kowalski's not a party. And so would be part and covered by the rule of sequestration, unless the other side agrees. So they are invoking the rule to exclude one of the beneficiaries, a 15-year-old child. Am I clear on that, counsel? Yes. Right, and the second then is uh, judge as to experts. Traditionally, experts uh, are accepted from the rule to the extent that they are necessary to take in testimony or evidence upon which they will comment later in the trial. And when you say experts, are we talking about those people that were specifically identified as experts on the witness list as opposed to a more generic description of expert? In this case, Your Honor, our idea were true retained experts, although based on the court's rulings, there's a lot of what were traditionally known as uh, non-retained experts that have been through the litigation treated as experts. Which is why I'm asking the question. And so, it's a non-retained expert. Everyone that's non-retained Right. Anyone who's an, uh, we're invoking the rule as to anyone who is a not a non-retained if you're a retained expert, yes. If you're non-retained, no. No. Tell them what you think. <laughs> Mr. Whitney. We'd like both retained and non-retained experts to be allowed to observe. And both sides have retained, both sides have non-retained experts on those lists that you mentioned. When, when you say a non-retained expert, are you talking about somebody that you did not designate on your witness list as an expert? No, we're talking about the uh, treating physicians that we had the hearing over where there was a determination of which, whether they were one or the other. The expert lists that were filed on both sides yeah. named both retained and non-retained experts. So I'm talking about both categories, Your Honor. It'd be nice to know who we're talking about here. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, How about some names? Um, at my, my only comment at this point where we're kind of at the blue smoke and mirror stage is that if, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. And I, we're going to, the reason I say that is we're going to have doctors who are going to, who want to watch. We all, we're also going to have doctors who are, who are in and out as corporate representatives. So, and, and, and many of these same doctors will be asked expert opinions on the stand, even though they were arrived in the course and scope of, of their treatment, and even though they're not experts. Well, I would suggest that both sides discuss with each other and see if you can come to an agreement, because ultimately, um, I'm either gonna do one of two things if you can. Either it's gonna be no one is allowed, period, the end, because it's gonna be easier to enforce, or it's going to be those only those that were specifically identified as an expert on the actual most recent expert list. It's going to be one of those two. Probably the former, but I could probably be talking to the latter, unless you all can agree otherwise. And I think it's instead of a broad category, I think you need to you know, sharpen the pencil and say this person, this person, this person, and this person. So, Judge, for the record, we are objecting to rotating corporate representatives. They should designate one representative. They've invoked the rule. They will not let uh, Kyle Kowalski in. Uh, we believe that under the rule, they yes, they can substitute a corporate representative, but not on a rotating basis, and it has to be after they have testified. So that they don't use that as a means of just bringing people in to listen to the testimony. And, and, and I will tell you, there, there is some, that argument's resonating with me, so perhaps what you all can do is 
discuss that as well and, and see if there's an accommodation that can be made on either side relative to your corporate reps and Kyle Kowalski. What's next? That's not true to Kyle. Uh, and, uh, let's see. Uh, well, that, we don't, we need to talk about it, Judge. About I, I mean, I, I'm not. I've done this both ways, and I, 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 I prefer to work something out. Uh, and I, I hope so, because I feel like I've already spent more time on the rule of sequestration in this case in the last five, <laughs> ten minutes than I have in any other case ever. So let's see if you can uh, work it out amongst yourselves. That's all we need for right now, Your Honor. Why, so, should, this, why should that issue be any different? I, I am hopeful we're going to have a very smooth professional trial. That's what I expect of both sides, and nothing less is going to be tolerated. Uh, 8.15 tomorrow morning, uh, we will start with legal arguments with the goal of having the jury walk in at 9 a.m. Uh, the court deputies will open the courtroom at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, and I'll try to have the Zoom open and uh, as well at that time, and I promise to try to remember to turn on the microphone this time. Okay. Have a good day, everybody. We'll be in recess.